Uh, welcome you all for today's uh, webinar hosted by the MD2K Center. Uh, we have Professor Gillian Hayes from the School of Information and Computer Sciences at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, uh, Professor Hayes is a thought leader in human computer interaction, a theme of great interest to the M Health community uh, as we develop technologies and technological solutions. Uh, it is also useful to keep in mind that it also needs to be relevant and acceptable to the people who will use it eventually, uh, which is uh, by far the weakest link in the chain right now. So, uh, so Gillian, uh, welcome, and uh, the uh, screen is all yours. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so I really appreciate you guys giving up an hour of your day here to talk with me. Um, I wanna encourage you to ask questions along the way. Um, you can probably, the easiest thing is to dump them into the chat window, but of course you can um, also ask Barbara to unmute you um, and we can do it vocally as well. Um, I'm gonna give you a really quick primer. Basically, this is what we teach our undergraduates in an entire quarter, and we're gonna cover it in about 45 minutes today. So bear with me and uh, please pay attention to the pointers for additional information as we go through. Also, I'm very happy to stay in touch afterwards. My contact information is there on the screen right now, and I will also provide that again at the end. And finally, I wanna thank not only um, you know Barbara and Vivek and everyone for, for hosting this, but also Julie Keynes at the University of Washington and Erica Poole who um, had a big part in creating what you're gonna see today. Um, we have each of us in various ways been giving some version of this talk for years now and it's very much a collaborative effort to get to where we are now. So for those of you who know them, they're great. And if you don't know them, you can get to know them. Okay, so we'll get you started a little bit here. Um, or maybe not, for some bizarre reason, my slides don't wanna advance. Let's try that again. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you're probably involved with this effort because you already are bought into the idea that we are in a time of massive innovation and opportunity in the health space and in the digital health space. And what does this look like? It looks like all kinds of things. Every time you go to your physician's office, you're probably getting some new instrument testing you in some way. You may be a person who wears a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or has a smart scale at home. You may be logging things like chronic pain or your nutrition or your weight on your smartphone application. These are all just examples of things that are coming through both the clinical channels and the consumer channels to change the way that we're thinking about and interacting with our bodies in terms of, of health and more broadly wellness. So as Vivek said in the introduction, that's wonderful. I think that means we have a lot of exciting opportunities. I talked to my colleagues over in electrical engineering and biomedical engineering and the kinds of things that they're doing in the development of new materials and new electronics is amazing. Where we're gonna be in 10 years has me very excited. At the same time, I know how hard it is to get people to actually use these things, whether it's a patient, a family member, a clinician, you know, the massive hurdle that we have is in sort of getting people to be able to and want to wear various kinds of sensors, understand and interpret their data, log all kinds of things that takes a lot of work. So where does that leave us? That leaves us in thinking more concretely about design. And I was at a talk by a sort of proper designer, if you will, uh, last week, and he said, oh, everyone thinks they're a designer in this very sort of dismissive way. And I will say to you, almost no one thinks they're a designer, but everyone should think they're a designer. And hopefully you will all think of yourselves as designers by the end of this uh, time that we have together today. So very simply, when we talk about design, this is the process of creating or shaping tools or artifacts, any kind of thing for direct human use. So what do we mean by this process? We really do want to, you know, design can be this mythical black box. People think of this as art or aesthetics or these other kinds of things. No, there are concrete processes and methods that we can use, that you can learn, 
to do design. And in many ways, you may already be doing them in your life. You're just not necessarily thinking about them as design. So you hear a lot about design thinking in business now that we need to be uh, intentionally designing all of the processes that we use from HR to banking to um, everything. So that's where we're at with the process, creating. This is a really important part. So I just sort of was a little bit dismissive and said, oh, design is not just art, but it is a creative endeavor. It can be creative in all kinds of ways. Even if you don't think of yourself as creative, you may in fact be an incredibly creative problem solver. Tools. So I mean tools really broadly. The output of design is stuff. These are things, everything that you're using from the water bottle you might be drinking out of to the mouse that you use to click to get onto this to the screen that you're using to look at uh, these slides right now. These are all things and everything in our life has been designed in some way or another. And finally, to remember that we need to have people-centered concerns. One of the things that can happen is we get so fixated on the data we can collect or the disease we can eradicate or the health outcome we can achieve that we forget the people in the center of that. So a lot of what we try to think about when we teach about design is to focus on these sort of people-centered concerns. So there's some basic characteristics of this. One, design is conscious. We want to always be thinking about what are we explicitly trying to accomplish with the work that we're doing. It should keep human concerns in the center. It is a conversation with materials. And what I mean by that is design is not just making something once and isn't that beautiful and perfect. It's about making something, looking at it, feeling it, using it and realizing how those materials are actually impacting the thing you were trying to create uh, and then doing it again and again and again. So it's very iterative. It is a creative process, as I already mentioned. Much of design is about communication. So it's about taking that idea that you have in your head and translating it into a piece of software, a piece of hardware, a process, a policy, something that actually communicates the intent that you had in your mind. Design has massive social implications. So we know that every single piece of technology that we create is getting put into the social world. It's getting used by people, it's getting observed to be used by other people, and it has all of these implications. And finally, design is a social activity. You cannot design on your own in isolation. Um, I think sometimes people have an idea of this brilliant designer, the sort of Steve Jobs in his black turtleneck sitting around uh, somewhere by himself in a room coming up with brilliant ideas. But in reality, most practical design activities involve lots and lots of communication, discussion, iteration, and social um, work. So what is designed? After, if you get that as your basic primary of what design is, then what are we actually designing? And David Kelly has this wonderful quote, look around you, the only thing not designed is nature. And every single thing, the, from the moment you cut down a tree to the house that you live in, to the chair that you're sitting in right now, these are all designed, often poorly, right? So people will say, well, it wasn't really designed, it was just thrown together. No, that was designed just really badly. Um, and so you have to always remember that we are surrounded by stuff that someone somewhere at some point, and more likely some team of people who went through multiple iterations and multiple um, steps of approval have designed. And given that context, then I hope you will recognize that you are all designers and you are also all design uh, critiquers. And what I mean by that is bad design is everywhere. Every time that something on your computer crashes, it is not you. It is bad design. Every time that you struggle to understand how to use something, whether it's those silly kiosks at the airport or your ATM or uh, Photoshop, whatever the thing is, that's bad design. So I'll give you some examples of bad design. And this is always fun. And if you run into other examples, please feel free uh, to send them my way. I like to add more. So here's an example of bad graphical design. So someone had to do the layout of this, of this newspaper. And they put an article about women being beaten by their husbands right next to an ad for Father's Day. Probably not really the connection that ASDA wanted to make in their advertising, and probably not really the connection the journalist who wrote that article needed to make, but someone designed this. This was not an accident. 
someone actually chose to put these things next to each other. Here's another sort of fun one where I suspect this was the algorithm's bad design. So you have here a website that's telling you about the phobia of being watched by a duck. And most likely uh, the connection got made in someone's algorithm in the back end that they put an Aflac ad with the funny little duck that watches you everywhere um, side by side with this article. And so you can see these are, um, you know, one of these is probably a graphic layouts person and one of them is probably an algorithm, but both are examples of where the design is broken. Um, another example that we bring up a lot uh, is where sensors are poorly designed, and so automatic faucets are a good example of this. Black clothing is really problematic for automatic faucets. Um, some of them have been uh, improved in this regard, but most automatic faucets still work this way. And black clothing also means that people with very dark skin often also struggle with these faucets. So it's poorly designed in multiple ways, one on the clothing and one on it's sort of excluding an entire set of human beings from being able to engage with these faucets. And then this is the one that if we were in person, we would all have a good giggle. Whoever designed this, um, it has obviously never seen men use a urinal because this would never work. You cannot, someone thought, well, the design constraint here is we're trying to maximize the number of urinals that we can fit into this space. This is how we will do it. But obviously two people are never going to use this system in this way. So another example of sort of misunderstanding the requirements, misunderstanding the constraints and bad design. So these are sort of funny um, and amusing, but, Bad design can also have massive other kinds of consequences. And one of the big examples of this in the last 20 years is the election here in the US in 2000. And what you saw, for those of you who, who either don't remember or didn't, um, were too young to know about this at the time, is they had this, they, the idea was to save the number of places that you'd actually have to punch cards. So the constraint they're maximizing here is the cost and the trouble of making these punch card spaces. So they put the punch card space down the middle of the ballot. And this meant that they had to put these little arrows pointing to exactly where you should place your vote if, depending on who you want to vote for. But this created a lot of confusion. And lots of people argued that when they walked out, they didn't realize who they had voted for. They did not vote in the way that they wanted and so on. <clears throat> So that has pretty major consequences um, in terms of, you know, things as big as a national election in a very contentious um, swing state and swing district. Similarly, you know, in sort of the medical world, the Therac 25 is one of these canonical examples that we use to talk about the importance of design. And for those of you who already know about this, um, this will be a quick uh, review, those of you who don't know about it, I would really encourage you to read up on the Therac disasters because they're, they're sort of fascinating what happened. But essentially, you have here a um, couple of places where the design was really poor. So one is in the um, device itself. So what you can see on the left there is the low current electron beam does not have a tray that blocks it. The high current does have a tray, and that moves it into this x-ray mode. And what happened is sometimes people would put in the high current beam, but without the tray. And what that happens essentially is you wind up burning people. So that was problematic in and of itself, that, that a mistake in whether or not the tray was put in, not matching correctly with the level of current could uh, create you know, a, a medical risk. But a, an additional problem here is that the machine the control panel to actually operate the Therac was in a different room than the patient was in. So you have an additional set of problems with the design. The software was poorly designed to control the machine. The machine itself was poorly designed. And then the way in which it was implemented in clinical practice was poorly designed because the technician operating the machine couldn't hear the patients complaining about the burning. So this is a really good example of several failure modes um, piled one on another. And I would argue that most medical error that you see in relation to technologies has multiple failure points, that the design is broken, not just in one place, but often in multiple. So what does that mean? Don't worry, 
we can try to help. There's lots and lots and lots of bad design. We're not going to make it so that the world doesn't have bad designs. There's always going to be things that frustrate you, but we can do our best in the things that we integrate with to do things better. So one example of this is 9X was looking to buy new workstations. They used human modeling that is a traditional HCI method to understand exactly what the model of human behavior would look like with the new workstations versus the old workstations. And what they found is that actually going up with a new workstation was going to be 3% slower than the original. And this was in the 80s. So $2 million a year was a lot of money. And this was a prevented mistake. So these are the kinds of things that you can do if you've got good HCI and design work behind you. Similarly, let's look here at what, for those of you who are on the clinical side of things, may be a familiar thing for you. This is, you know, someone's lab work. They're showing the lipid counts, it's showing the, the complete blood work, and so on. This printout is just four, the first of four really dense pages. It's really hard for clinicians to look through this, so hard that in fact, in practice, you'll often see um, a nurse or a physician's assistant go through first and highlight anything that they want the physician to look at. Um, but even still, this is hard and it's almost incomprehensible for your average patient. A simple redesign from a graphical design standpoint would change things dramatically, right? So if we look at this version of the exact same data, you can see a flag showing where the person is if they're on, um, if they look like they've got any risky categories. It explains the results and so on. Now, I also want to put a caveat on this. So we look at this. This can be printed on any printer, including very old printers that um, have simple ink, just black and white, and so on. This kind of thing would require um, a printer that can do a higher DPI, a printer that can do color, and so on. So I want to just raise this with the caveat that, yes, of course, this looks dramatically better than this. But what this means in practice is that someone is working with a bunch of constraints. So when you think about your designs, you have to not only think about what is the best sort of artifact and product to come out, clearly this colorful version is far superior to the other, but also think about the design as it sits within existing processes. What would it cost to swap out every single printer in your hospital to one that can print color high DPI? And is that worth it? And how do you make this work? Or do you put these into people's electronic health records? They can do them at home and so on it goes. So there's your introduction. By the end of this talk, um, we've got sort of three goals for today. So one is um, for those of you who are on the clinical side of things, how do we care for and feed the technical geeks in your lives? How do we collaborate as researchers who are in computer science or electrical engineering or biomedical engineering? How do we collaborate with clinicians in a way that is useful for everyone? The second major goal is I wanna make sure you have a sense of low cost, quick methods that will help you with your usability and utility of your technologies. So we can at least knock out that confound when we're thinking about the health outcomes and the adoption. And then finally, uh, how do we create some technology prototypes? So for those of you who've never done any kind of design work, you might think this is crazy. We're not gonna be able to do this in the next half hour, but you absolutely can. You already have the skills to do design work. You just don't necessarily think of yourselves that way. So let's talk a little bit about interdisciplinary collaborations along these lines. So an important point, information computer scientists and designers are very different than biomedical researchers, psychologists, mental health researchers, and so on. So number one thing, the publishing practices and technical disciplines are incredibly different, particularly for the computer scientists. Almost all of our papers are in, published in conferences that have very tight reviews. So, so they look quite a bit like journal articles. In fact, they're longer than your average AMA paper, but they're published at conferences. And that can make finding the work, publishing the work, and sort of understanding the value of work very challenging when you're reaching across these disciplines. A second issue is our ways of working with graduate students are really different. So for example, my PhD students tend to lead their projects. 
Whereas when I work with MD PhD students, they very much are a part of a working machine and a lab and so on. And that's quite different. Similarly, our PhD students almost never call me Dr. Hayes. And that's another thing that is uh, always a little bit jarring for our PhD students when they go over to the medical school to understand that everyone refers to everyone as doctor. Um, so just these little things show that our cultures are different. And so it can be important to just sit down when you start a new project and flesh out what are you going to actually do? Who's going to be in charge of what? What kinds of agency and power and responsibilities do we want to give people? And in what places are, are they going to be looking for direction? Our relationship with theory is quite different. So particularly in HCI, um, we bring in a lot of different social science perspectives. And so often we're looking to develop new theories or we're looking to build on theories in ways that look quite different than sort of a, a biological sciences model of theory as uh, something that you will build on to test um, later. And then finally, we can't guarantee that you're going to find our work in PubMed. Increasingly, um, PubMed and other indices are trying to cross um, analyze their uh, publications, and so it's getting better. But it's challenging, and it's almost certainly not going to be in uh, medical journals. Apologies for that typo there. <laughs> I just noticed it. So. What does that mean? Uh, it means that literature reviews are really challenging. So for my PhD students who work in this space, I try to get them to not only search things like the ACM and IEEE libraries, but to really focus on PubMed and medical libraries as well. When I sit on committees for students in uh, the med school or biological sciences, I push them to be looking in the ACM and IEEE space, but it's not something that's straightforward and simple. The good news is that we're super complementary. So yes, we're different, but we're not different in ways that are uh, competitive or problematic. So computing researchers tend to do certain things really well. Um, we can find competent and relatively cheap technical labor. That's a good thing. Um, although our graduate students bristle when they get asked to just build an app that someone else has already designed. They wanna be a part of the whole process. We're very good at identifying and overcoming a whole series of constraints. So thinking about the technical constraints, the usability constraints, the sort of adoption and cultural context surrounding the technologies that might create opportunities or challenges, this is what uh, researchers in HCI and our students are really trained to do well. Um, so we tend to measure our successes and failures with respect to the design process, how quickly and easily a technology is adopted, how it is used, and so on. That means there's a whole bunch of things that we don't do as well. Uh, so one in particular is measuring health and wellness outcomes, thinking about how do we really create that evidence base that would allow something to be translated into practice. And then translating that research to practice. Our technologies and our studies often end at sort of the pilot stage. So getting to that next step is something that's not um, as well understood in HCI as it is in other areas. And then finally, clinicians and clinical researchers are incredibly good at research design. The work that I have done in partnership with folks that, are, that really have strong clinical uh, research experience, I can tell you that our studies are much, um, much stronger and we can believe in those results much more than when we aren't working with folks like that. So that's an area where, where computer scientists, HCI and designers often need some help. So some homework. Um, I mentioned I was going to flag some things along the way for people who are interested in particularly reading more. So if you are um, either a computer scientist, electrical engineer, and so on, or on the clinical side of things, and you are interested in doing this kind of work, I strongly recommend uh, these three papers to help think about how do we do these kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations? What does team science really look like? And how can we do translational, but also interdisciplinary biomedical research? These are three great articles for that. So I hope at this point I've convinced you that it's good to work with designers, um, that it's good to work with people in HCI, that we have a role to play. Um, you know, sitting in this process. But I also hope that you will realize that you can often do some of this work yourself as well. Um, and I don't know who G4 is, um, 
but I, and so I don't know what you want me to post in the chat. Um, oh, the, the uh, yes, I can do that. Sorry, now I understand what you're asking me. Um, no, I can't, I'll have to do it later. Sorry, I can't, uh, I can't copy and paste the references right now, but I will do so later. Um, great question. Um, perhaps uh, Barbara may be able to grab them. I think she has my slides as well. Um, okay, so we'll get those references out to you guys later. And in the meantime, let's talk about how you can learn to do design well. So first of all, um, if you're American, you probably heard the expression uh, lipstick on a pig. If you're not, you have this uh, funny, adorable um, little pig here. But it's really important to realize that design is not just ha changing how things look, making them pretty, making the graphics, putting a shine on something after it's already done. The one time that I will say absolutely no, I will not collaborate with someone is when they bring me a completely broken, poorly designed system and say, well, you know, it's completely broken and poorly designed and we and no one's using it. So can you just like make it pretty and add some nice things to it? You can't do it that way. You have to design your systems from the ground up, thinking about the human user the entire way. And some key things to be able to do that well. So Don Norman always says the user is not like me. And this is one of the most important things to learn. We often have an instinct about how we might design a piece of technology. Unfortunately, that instinct often comes from thinking about, well, what would I want uh, for my piece of technology? And what you want is almost certainly not going to be what anyone else wants. Everyone who's watching this probably has some sort of advanced degree as a starting point. The majority of the world does not. Everyone who's watching this and listening to it speaks English. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to understand me. Not everyone in the world speaks English. On it goes, right? You'll probably have a whole bunch of resources available to you that every user is not going to have. So important to first get out of your own head in that way. The next thing is thinking about ideation. So Linus Pauling said the best way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas. And there's actually been research in brainstorming that indicates that the best outcomes come when large groups of people sit quietly by themselves with the goal of just coming up with the most ideas they possibly can. And then you merge those ideas together and start to do critique of them. But start with just creating tons and tons of quantity of ideas. And often that's the first step in, in thinking about design is getting out of your own head and trying to think of the craziest ideas that you can. And then finally, IDEO, um, who's sort of well known as an agency of doing great design work, they talk about enlightened trial and error. Or as for those of you who know my um, dissertation advisor, Dr. Gregory Abowd, he always used to say, fail fast. The first thing you want to do is just get something out there into someone's hands and fail because that's the way that you really learn is by making mistakes in your design and seeing what people think about it, what people are doing differently. That said, it's not like we just go off like cowboys with no plans whatsoever. We do have design processes and why do we have these? Well, for one, it helps us get started with a proven method, so we ha it's not as intimidating. If you, can, if you can sort of follow through a design process, it's less scary. It prevents designer's block, which is essentially like writer's block, the sitting there with a blank piece of paper and a pen terror of I don't know what to make. A formal design process always keeps us directed towards a final product. So I said you should have lots and lots of ideas, yes. You should have divergent ideas, yes. But that doesn't mean that you should go off in a completely different direction towards something else that's not the final product. It helps stay on schedule and within cost. You get bad scope creep with any kind of software if you don't have a formal design process that helps you understand how are you going to collect the requirements, how are you going to iterate on your system, and when are you going to call things done. All of those things are important for sort of the scope that you're going to have. Uh, a formal design process helps us measure our progress so you know where you are, what step are you at in your process, are you on time, and are you going to get the outcomes that you want. It helps us communicate to other people. So if we have a shared language and a shared understanding of our process, we can tell other folks where we're at. Prevents you from omitting important steps. So 
if we know we have to go through the whole process, we're not going to accidentally forget to have a broad ideation session or accidentally forget to check in with our users. It's way more reliable than intuition. So I told you at the very beginning, design has this mystique about it. People think, oh, you're just a talented designer or you're not. Actually, a lot of that talent is really about going through the process. It forces us to iterate and it always keeps the user first in our minds. So we talked about things being designed. There's a couple of ways that people look at this. So one is very much the artifact view. So the object we're trying to design, the device, the system, the process. Um, a more holistic view, and this is the one that I tend to take, talks about user experience, the interaction, the flow. And a sort of non-medical example I'll give you for this is when you think about going to a hotel chain, let's say Marriott, they think about the user experience of Marriott as you go online to book your hotel. You maybe have a Marriott app that reminds you of when your hotel reservation is. Perhaps you call in because you realize you need to make a change or something was confusing on the website. You eventually get to the hotel and you need to look at the lobby, check into your room, and then go to your room. All along those ways, the idea for Marriott is that they want that experience to be consistent and feel like it's one large interaction flow. And that's how I think of user experience. When you think about a hospital, it, you shouldn't feel jarred. When you walk in, it should be a smooth transition into your room, into your processes that you're going through all the procedures and exiting on the other side. And the reason I think it's important to think of this sort of holistic view is that that allows us to really concretely think about the user's goals, because a user's goals might include interacting with a whole bunch of systems, both analog and digital and human. And when we think of just the artifact, well, artifacts don't really have goals. People have goals. And we want to keep the user in the center uh, from the beginning all the way through the end. So people will sometimes think of a design process in this really simplistic way. If we're kicking a soccer ball, we're going to kick it. It's going to, we're going to do a sketch, prototype, try it out, done, hooray. No, <laughs> this is not how design looks in uh, practice almost ever. Instead, we see these very complicated circular kinds of design processes. And there are lots and lots of design processes. So I'm going to walk you through one model but there are many others. And this model starts with the idea that we're investigating our problem, we're gonna ideate on many solutions, prototype those potential solutions, evaluate our prototypes, and hopefully eventually produce some kind of end product. Note, however, that yes, this is generally a circle, but there's also lots and lots of dotted lines. It can be that we go back to different stages of this circle at any point. So let's start with investigate. Why do we investigate? This basically means trying to understand the problem. You cannot design separate from the people who are going to use the system. You cannot just sit in a room somewhere and intuit what people are going to need to know. You have to dig in and understand and design. And so the example I always like to give for this is thinking about uh, phones. So Nokia um, you know, was sort of one of the original uh, developers of mobile phones, smartphones, and so on. They were sort of the major player in the 90s. And Nokia did lots of really interesting research during this time to deeply understand how people use their phones because they found that no one's using the phone the way that they originally thought they would in the lab. Instead, they're using two phones at once, they're plugging in headphones, they're riding their bicycles while they're like eating ice cream and talking on the phone. You have to get out in the world and see the way in which people are doing these things. And this is something that the design process and the practitioners at, at Nokia really mastered. So the kinds of questions that we might ask when we're in this stage of investigation, we're going to think about who are the primary users. So if it's an electronic medical record, is it going to be only the clinicians or is it going to be parents, uh, the patient themselves, other family members and so on? Then identify additional stakeholders. So there's often lots and lots of other people who surround the user of the actual technology. So if we think of the technology of a vehicle, for example, a car. It's not just the driver. The driver is arguably the sort of primary user. They're, they're sitting behind the steering wheel driving it, but you've also got 
the people that are sitting in the car with them. You've got uh, people in other cars that are nearby, perhaps uh, people who are pedestrians near the road and so on. So there's lots and lots of stakeholders who surround the actual user. And then think about what are their requirements? What's the problem? What are you really trying to solve? Are there pain points in what people are doing? How are they doing it now? Are they doing workarounds or are they just suffering? How long does it take? Is this a really uh, long procedure or is this something that people are doing very quickly now and therefore any solution you need to develop will also have to be rapid? What do the, the users and their surrounding stakeholders want? And what do they need? And importantly, those two questions are different. So thinking about the tension sometimes between what they want and what they need. What else have they tried? You'll, you're almost always, when you go into an organization to start trying to understand their problems, have a sort of organizational historian who can tell you every possible solution that they have tried that has failed. And then you can think about why did it fail? Was the solution the problem or was it solution and implementation and timing? And so it may well be that the solution already exists and you just need to try it again in some slightly different way or because things have changed in the outside context, you can use that solution now. These are all the kinds of questions you start thinking about in these early stages. The kinds of methods you might use are surveys if you've got a really large number of people that you need to talk to, focus groups if you wanna get a sense of group dynamics in addition to talking through the various challenges, one-on-one -on -one interviews, analysis of competition. I always tell people this is really important thing to think through. Who else is in this space and what else are they doing? Because you can learn both from their successes and their failures. And it's often much easier to sort of replicate and tweak something someone else is doing than to come up with a brand new idea yourself. Contextual inquiry and design ethnography, these are both tools that are essentially fieldwork focused tools in which you go into spaces, observe what people are doing, try to understand all of the dynamics of the social and cultural and physical space in which they're doing their work and all of the tools that they're currently using and develop those into design insights for the future. Okay, so once we've collected a bunch of data about what's going on and tried to understand it, it's time to ideate. And this can be both the most intimidating and the most fun part of this process. Ideation is all about idea generation. So when I said intimidating, a lot of people think they're not creative. They think they can't come up with a good idea. And so to those people, I say, volume is what matters. Don't worry about creating good ideas just create ideas because the good ones will fall out and too much fixation on making sure you've got only high quality ideas is going to knock out some of your best ones so to increase the chances for success you want to do this in a systematic way and one of these is as i mentioned earlier if you're brainstorming in a group the best way to get a high volume of brainstormed ideas is to have everyone work quietly by themselves until they've exhausted their own ideas. Once people start talking to each other, we get into all these sort of group think or critiquing or intimidation because my idea is not as good as someone else's and so on. So the best thing to do is really to have everyone work independently in a systematic way and then bring those ideas together. And one of the absolute worst things you can do is go with the first idea that you get. There is this instinct often because either an idea is really good or the person who presented it <clears throat> is incredibly charismatic and has convinced everyone that this is a good idea. But whatever the case may be, you don't want to go with the first idea that you get. If it really is the best idea, I promise it will still be there an hour later and you can come back to it. There are lots of methods for ideation and you can you know, look up any of these online and there's all kinds of YouTube tutorials and everything else in the world for doing these things. So one that you'll see most commonly, um, if you think of pictures of designers, you're probably seeing them doing things that are uh, largely like affinity diagramming. So this is the sort of canonical post-it notes on a whiteboard, thinking through all those ideas that you've just generated and trying to group them and move them around and understand what are the features that might be existent in any particular solution, how do these relate to one another and so on. Uh, personas is largely about taking data that you collected in your investigation phase and thinking through 
okay, what's a type of person, a sort of cartoon character, if you will, of an individual who might be a user or a stakeholder in this group? Scenarios, this is one of my favorite things to do is go back to your field work and, and maybe you merge a couple of uh, days of data that you have, but think through what are some real life ways in which someone might run into the problem we're trying to solve or use a solution that we're trying to propose and write those out like little stories. Role playing, play acting scripts, you'd be amazed at how much you can learn just by getting your design team to pretend to do a clinical encounter either with or without some new piece of technology. Card sorting, this is often again like an affinity diagramming, you might have a list of features or a list of challenges or opportunities and you get different people to sort of sort these and different members of your design team will often have very different ideas about how things are working and in seeing the way in which those different ideas come together, you can start to get an idea of what some solutions might work. Structured brainstorming, I mentioned that earlier, that's the sort of each individual works by themselves to brainstorm and then you bring them together. And then finally, sketching. And we're going to talk about sketching again in the next little section here, but I cannot emphasize to you enough how important sketching is. You probably all drew as children and you probably thought you were a brilliant artist. And somewhere along the line, someone told you that you're not a brilliant artist. And now if I asked you, you will say to me, oh, I can't draw. Yes, you can. Everyone can sketch their ideas, absolutely. And I strongly encourage people who want to do any kind of design work to just carry around a notebook with you. And when you see a, something that you think is poorly designed, sketch it out and sketch out a potential solution to it. You don't even have to share these with anyone, but just get in the practice of drawing a little something every day and you'd be amazed at how many ideas you'll come up with. And you can practice this anytime. So after we've got our list of ideas, what are we gonna do with them? Well, we need to prototype these solutions so we can get some feedback. Why do we prototype? It's super hard to evaluate an idea. If you tell me conceptually about something, chances are good I'm gonna say, yeah, that seems reasonable. It, but it's really hard actually for either users or other designers or other kinds of stakeholders to react to these kinds of abstract concepts. When you actually start prototyping, you get to communicate your design to others and you communicate it to yourself. So you start to see the kinds of subtleties and nuances, assumptions you were making, technical constraints that might be causing you challenges and so on. Fundamental things about prototyping. First of all, build it fast. So this is what I said earlier, fail fast. The faster you can get a prototype made, the faster you can get feedback on it. And that means building it at the right fidelity. And when we talk about fidelity, I'm talking about low fidelity prototypes might be things that are just on paper. They might be terrible little sketches. They might be post-it notes or anything. And then you can make something in software later. Don't spend a whole bunch of time building a piece of software that might not even be the right thing to be building. Don't over-engineer it. You wanna really concentrate on what are the unknowns? What do I need help understanding? And leave everything else out as sort of the fluff and the gravy. And then this is one of the hardest things. Do not become attached to it. So much like in the ideation phase, you do not want to become attached to the first idea you come up with. You do not want to become attached to the very first prototype you come up with. Be prepared to throw it away. It might be that your team had exactly the wrong idea and you don't know it until you do that prototype. And that step is really important. There may be no other way to ever know that that was the wrong idea except trying it. So often you wanna even build multiple of them concurrently, both because users can compare two things much better than they can in just considering one. So if you just give them one thing, most of the time they'll sort of be like, oh yeah, that's okay. If you give them two options, they can say, oh, this is what I like better than that. Um, and I sort of joke sometimes, it's a little bit like the eye exams that, that we've all had, you know, where you sort of say number one, number two, number one, number two, and keep showing people different options until you get a better sense of what they're actually preferring. If you build multiple, it's also easier to throw one away because you don't feel like you've wasted your effort because you've built a bunch of things. So how do we prototype? This is probably the thing that you're the most unfamiliar with if you're not from a technical discipline. I want to really emphasize all you need is a piece of paper. If you want to throw things away, you just create a super rapid prototype, 
Otherwise, anything else would be too expensive. We're just trying to get a user reaction. An incremental prototype, on the other hand, we might use parts of it. So then you start to build it as a separate component. You prototype and test each one, and then you add them in incrementally to the final system. And the third option, which is uh, the least likely if you're doing a brand new idea, the most likely if you're trying to build onto an existing big system, is you take something, you alter it to incorporate some design changes, and it evolves into the final product. Low fidelity prototypes are things like this. I'm gonna flip through these relatively quickly, but you'll be able to get the references uh, when Barbara posts them. But things like storyboarding, this is like comic books. I mentioned we really like scenarios. This paper here by myself and Kai Trong will tell you sort of how to do storyboarding in a really pragmatic way and what we saw as best practices for helping users understand uh, uh, various kinds of sketches and designs. Paper prototypes, there's a great book on paper prototyping that you can buy that tells you all of these kinds of things. But you can see here, this is not a pretty design, but it does the job. It helps people understand what would this basically look like. So do not be intimidated and feel like you have to be a great artist to be able to do some basic paper drawn out, hand drawn paper prototypes. You can use things like poster board, blank paper, index cards work great for things like dialog boxes and pop-ups because you can sort of swap them out really quickly. Markers and pens, a highlighter, scissors. You know, this is stuff that you, this is like your kid's school supplies. Just raid your kid's school supplies and you are ready to do some prototyping. Some various ideas that you might use for background. So I have students turn in sometimes a poster board that is supposed to serve as the desktop, and then they're putting stickies and other things all over them to serve as the applications. Manila folders work really well if you want to try to simulate tabbed dialogues. If you want to use screenshots, you can still do paper prototyping by printing out existing screens and cutting them and sort of moving them in and out in really manual ways when you're walk, walking through ideas with users. Um, the Carolyn Snyder book that I mentioned you can buy on paper prototyping is great. It does have some old screenshots like this one where you see got the Palm 5 from years and years ago, but the idea remains. You can pull in and out your different kinds of hand-drawn screens on top of an actual device that you imagine you might use. And this gives users some um, sort of realism to the paper prototyping experience. You can incorporate physical devices. So you can actually show, well, here's how we imagine the physical device might interact with the paper. And so the piece that you have working well, you can put on a physical device. And the piece that you're hand drawing still, you can put on your poster board or, or whatever. You can show scrolling. Again, I just want to show you all these examples so that you can see how absolutely ugly these things can be and still be very functional for getting the kinds of feedback you need. So don't spend your time trying to make your scroll bars look perfect. Just sketch them out quickly. And in fact, often while you're sitting down with a user, you might even want to sit there and try to um, watch something, at, watch, walk through something and start sketching while you're doing things. And here what you see in this video is the user is pressing buttons and behind the scenes, you've got someone sliding in the paper-based prototype. So this allows for some feeling of sort of interactivity, but still your very basic paper prototype. Similarly, here we have radio buttons and so on. So what is that? I hope that you've seen that you can do some prototyping with something really simple. I promised all of you would be able to prototype. This is how. There are limitations to paper, of course. So mouse use um, doesn't work quite right on paper. You can't zoom in or have high, uh, high fidelity video if you're doing a paper-based prototype. And there can be unexpected issues like the page refresh time is obviously going to be very slow if you're waiting for a human to physically take a post-it, stick it on your paper prototype, and so on. So if a sort of realistic time response is important for what you're trying to test with this artifact, then paper prototyping may not work. Medium fidelity prototypes. These are the kinds of things that we do in PowerPoint or other kinds of things. Wizard of Oz is one of the best things you can do here. And for those of you who don't know the movie, first of all, everyone go watch the movie. But the idea of the Wizard of Oz is that there is a man behind the curtain who is making it seem as though the great uh, Wizard of Oz is actually doing all of these wonderful things. 
what this means in um, our world is that the user sees something they think the computer is doing, but in another room, there is someone we call the wizard, who is usually a research assistant who's acting as the computer. And this worked really well back in the days when, for example, we didn't have Siri to do excellent kind of speech recognition. You'd have a human pretending to be the computer doing speech recognition. Similarly, we can do basic wireframing. So there's lots of design tools out there that will let you click and drag and even add some interactive functionality. And they'll make it look like a fully working piece of software without you actually having to write any code. PowerPoint and Keynote do this incredibly well, actually. You can make great demos out of just using simple things like PowerPoint. OmniGraffle, I like quite a bit for the Mac. Kaku is a free tool that you can download. And then things like Envision from Adobe are quite nice because you can go from sort of Photoshop screens all the way into clickable prototypes and, and more. There's lots of tools out there for doing this kind of medium fidelity prototyping. Once we have a prototype, we need to evaluate it. That's the whole point of the prototype. So evaluation for us looks very different than the kinds of outcomes trials that health researchers will have. So we're looking at things like, what are the usability problems in the space? We're starting to, as a research field, try to have automated procedures to find usability problems. It's an active research area. It's really hard. We're not quite there yet. So we need to do user trials. We can't iterate if we don't know what to fix. So this answers two important questions about design. Did we build the right thing? So was our idea correct in the first place? And did we build it right? Is it usable, functional, and well-designed? All kinds of uh, evaluation methods. I would say, for people who are brand new to this space, check out the Nielsen Norman Group's um, article that I have linked here on discount usability. So these are things like cognitive walkthrough, which allows you to walk through the interface in a bunch of scenarios of use, basic um, testing that does not involve tons and tons of users. Once you've gone past that stage, then you can start to think about laboratory experiments in which we might do usability testing or even real world deployments, where again, we're probably gonna use a small number of users. This looks like pilot studies for people who eventually go to clinical trials, but start to understand how does this system get used in practice? Evaluation should drive your iteration. So if we see that the problems are in the user performance, but the idea itself is sound, we probably need to return to the prototyping phase. If the problems are in the conceptual model and users can't comprehend what we're even asking them to do with the system, we probably need to return to the ideation phase. And if the problems are in usefulness or appropriateness, well, we probably didn't investigate this problem well in the first place. So whatever comes out of the evaluation should drive what you do next in your iterative cycle. And if your evaluation at some point shows that everything looks great, we can move into production. And this is the part that means translation into something that could potentially be used in a clinical trial. So at this point, we have to build the actual software architecture. If we've developed new hardware, we're gonna have to manufacture and package it. If we're gonna have help systems, manuals, training, and so on, that all needs to happen. And eventually things like marketing, whether we're marketing to clinicians to potentially do a major research trial, or whether we're marketing to customers because something's gonna actually go on the commercial market. There is no agreement on design processes. So I work, walked you through one model, but there are many and you should do whatever works for you. The main point is to use a design process systematically, thoughtfully and consistently. So you'll see some design processes that look like this very simple iterative view, just design, implement, evaluate, design, implement, evaluate, right? That's a very simple view of things. Um, IDEO's process basically says we diverge and then converge. We diverge and then converge and go round and round this. A similar sort of the hot thing right now is this double diamond design process, which again is sort of says, let's do divergent research, convergent on insights, divergent on ideation, convergent on prototypes and go round and round. So you can see there are lots and lots of similarities in these different processes. The point is not to choose any particular one, but to choose one and do it in a way that, that feels good to you. So in summary, with our last few minutes here, 
Design is a highly iterative, iterative process and you must be committed to that. The thing that I think is often intimidating about design is feeling like we have to get it right the first time. And you absolutely do not. The entire process is built on this idea that we're gonna go round and round. Design processes must keep the primary stakeholders' interests central throughout. It starts with understanding the people. It needs to end with understanding the people and a recognition that designs are never going to be perfect. We can always do better. Every single thing out there that is designed could be designed better. But thinking about what are the constraints? What are the financial constraints? What are the time constraints? What are the other pieces of context into which this design must exist? And then finally, it's a real skill to know when to stop iterating and call a design finished. So certainly there are people that are talented designers, but the biggest skill you can learn is to know when you feel like you can be done enough to move on to doing something else. So if you wanna learn more, um, I would encourage you, I actually think there is another session. I have the next session starts August 8th. I think that's actually wrong. There is a Coursera course out there on human-centered design um, that I've heard really good things about. There's also, um, a lot of different kinds of professional master's degrees. I will. I can only tell you about ours in detail. Um, we just closed our applications for 2017, but um, they will open again in a couple of months for 2018. Please get in touch if you have any questions. Um, I believe Barbara will post the video as well as references for folks, but please get in touch. I'm always happy to send you more information uh, as we can do to, to get more folks into this space. So thanks everyone.